I guess we, if we start with how, how each of you first began to get involved in it. Well, I got interested when, uh, in about 1985 when I was asked to write a, a chapter in a book on anatomy and physiology of the skull, because I've been appointed a consultant and I had an interest in the skull and nose and sinuses. And I just couldn't reconcile the complete differences between humans and our eight cousins who are still swinging around in trees as they were 20 million years ago. And I thought, you know, we're bipedal, we walk on two legs rather than four, we have subcutaneous fat, we have uh, big brains, uh, completely different heat regulation system. And I thought this can't be because we just came down from the trees onto the savanna and stood upright because we could see further on the grass. They look around me. <laughs> and you took up that thing about uh, being by the waterside and uh, an easy meal, even a pregnant woman could uh, uh, search for that. Yes, I, I think the, um, the story of trying to trace humanity's evolution has been based on bones, fossil bones. Because we're talking about way back, we're talking about, about the Australopithecines, about mm. little ape-like creatures that were standing up. The, the notion that we were developed on the savannah has always been there because the people have been looking at the bones. Mm. And of course the bones can only tell you so much. And the theory of human evolution is based on that. When suddenly you've got a, anomalies to do with the various fats, with the body, the body the soul, and the various structures in the throat, so on, which don't make any kind of sense until you actually sorted out the detail. You, with your expert knowledge, of, of human anatomy, saw all sorts of things that you didn't know. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all so very much for coming. Um, I'm Elaine Morgan, and I can't imagine that many of you have not heard about the aquatic ape theory, or you probably wouldn't be here. Um, just a quick synopsis, as it started, my mother had come across a single Eureka paragraph in a book talking about human beings having been more aquatic in the past. The more she looked into it, the more aquatic features she found. Please welcome to David Attenborough. Thank you very much indeed, you should really hearing from Peter about this book. Um, in my view, I will be brief. In my view, this is a total uncontrovertible demonstration that our view of the history of the paleo history of humanity has been quite misguided. He presents a whole series of arguments, our lack of hair, our subcutaneous fat, I won't list them all because I dare say Peter will. But what I would say is this. It is quite extraordinary how professional anthropologists have dealt with this theory over the last 15 years. They've dealt with it with venom. They, it, it, it is quite irrational, the extreme things they say. And I was pondering as to why this would be so. And I think I know the answer. Paleoanthropologists, human anthropologists, have constructed the history of mankind, and, well, yes, mankind, from five million years ago, almost entirely on bones. And that's their people, that's their trade, stock in trade. And using those bones, they never look at anything else. When a man who knows about the soft parts comes into this, he produces a whole set of new arguments. If you buy the book, you will find at least two, which are, to my mind, conclusive. 
One is to do with the things called exostoses in the, in the ear canal, uh, which <clears throat> develop their bulging growths on the ear canal, which occur amongst people today who spend a lot of time diving. Extraordinary. And they have been discovered in the skulls of the, the period that we're talking about, human skulls. Another extraordinary uh, revelation in Peter's book, which is also new, is that human babies, when they're born, are covered in a, in a membrane called the vernix. It's a very strange thing. Nobody quite understands why. There is no other primate that we know that has a, 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 a vernix. Peter and his workers, co-workers, have discovered that there is another creature which has found uh, a vernix, seals. <laughs> and what is more, <clears throat> chemically, biochemically, the, the molecule which is responsible and the gene which is responsible for producing a vernix is identical. Thank you all very much for coming and thank you Gareth and uh, David for all those uh, very kind words. I looked at the hearing mechanism of various mammals. Some who lived on land, where they need an open ear canal for hearing. Others who have taken to the sea, the whales, the dolphins, their ear canals are totally closed off and they've developed this sonar mechanism for hearing. But the semi-aquatic mammals, who spend part of the time on land, part of the time swimming and diving, they need to hear on land but they also need to protect their delicate eardrums when they're diving. And I looked at these semi-aquatic mammals and all of them had some mechanism to close off or narrow the ear canal for diving, to protect the delicate eardrum. And in fact, the seal has an exostosis. Um, and I thought, if it's okay for a seal, why not for man? So, to me, this is a very, very important book. <laughs>